fellow Northern Republican named Hannibal Hamlin from the great state of Maine. And when Lincoln goes for re-election in 1864, he pats Hannibal on the back and says, wonderful job, old boy, go home. And he chooses as his running mate, Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson is going to be a thorn in everybody's side for Reconstruction. Andrew Johnson is chosen for very important symbolic reasons. He had been a senator from Tennessee. Tennessee seceded and became a Confederate state, but he was the only senator from a Southern Confederate state who refused to join the Confederacy. So Andrew Johnson, through all of this, he was a Southern Democrat, senator from a now Confederate state, who was a staunch Unionist. He would not join the Confederacy. So he remains totally loyal to the Union and loyal to the Lincoln administration. When the Union Army forces invade and occupy Tennessee, beginning, I want to say, in 1862, and Tennessee remains occupied territory for the rest of the war, Johnson is the one who is made the wartime governor of Tennessee to oversee the military occupation of the state. So from Lincoln's vantage point, Johnson is going to be the proverbial olive branch to the South. He's a Southerner, he's a Democrat, he's from one of the Confederate states, so that when the war comes to an end and it's time for post-war reconstruction, Lincoln can say, I have one of your own people in my cabinet. Someone from the opposite party, someone from the South, who can help ease the transition in the post-war period. So that is, in large part, why Lincoln chooses Johnson. But Johnson has a major fundamental flaw. He's pro-union, but he's also pro-slavery. So he's just like the conservative unionists in Kentucky that we talked about. Pro-union, pro-slavery. So he's the kind of vice presidential choice where you're like, okay, I can kind of see why Lincoln chose him, but let's hope nothing bad happens to Lincoln. And then something bad happens to Lincoln. You know, he ends up being assassinated a week after the war is over. So now we have Johnson as president of the United States. And Congress is made up of all northern radical Republicans. So this immediately causes a certain degree of chaos in the federal government, because you have a president and a Congress who are completely at odds with how they envision post-war reconstruction to occur. Johnson was not thrilled about the, uh, about the 13th Amendment, but it was already out to the states for ratification. So from his vantage point, there should be nothing beyond the 13th Amendment. They should, that it should be the law of the land with regard to the statement on the status of African Americans, and that is it. He also wanted to provide amnesty to ex-Confederates and give back confiscated land and basically have 10% you know, of ex-Confederates give loyalty oaths to the United States and all sins will be forgiven. Congress, however, wanted to see the southern states fundamentally change before they were allowed back into the Union. That, that instead of just, you know, all you got to do is ratify the 13th Amendment and then you're back in, Congress wants to see fundamental alterations made within these southern states. And so while this very open and public disagreement is ensuing, and essentially, the, the, the federal government has its proverbial back turned on the South while they're arguing with each other over what to do. White Southerners take advantage of this to try and put things back together the way they had been before the war, to try and reestablish the traditional social and racial hierarchies, and to exert control over the freed population. And so, in order to do so, white Southerners across the now ex-Confederate states 
begin passing local and state level laws called black codes. So these were laws that tried to restrict free people in ways that were similar to how they had been restricted while enslaved. So for example, you couldn't gather in large groups, you couldn't carry firearms, you couldn't be in certain towns after sundown, or you could not enter into a town without a pass that showed that you were, that you were gainfully employed. And in terms of those kinds of restrictions, you could walk into a town and immediately be confronted by the chief of police asking for your pass of employment. And let's say, you know, you're not employed. You're fresh off the plantation. You don't have physical proof of employment, a labor contract on you. Well, you have to pay a $5 fine. I don't have $5 to pay a fine. Okay, you're going to serve five days in jail or we're gonna hire you out to Mr. Johnson's farm for the next five days to pay off your fine. So this creates a cycle of re-enslavement. You know, creating elaborate rules so that without calling it slavery, freed people could essentially be re-enslaved. We see examples of African-American children being kidnapped from their families and brought to plantations under the guise of, this is an apprenticeship. And families trying to figure out legal means to get their children back who have been taken away from them. So white Southerners, they, they enact these codes in order to try and get things back as close to slavery as they had been without explicitly going against the 13th Amendment. And the effectiveness of the Black Codes speaks to the limits of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. Because the 13th Amendment abolished slavery, but it does nothing else. Does anybody remember the Supreme Court's ruling in Dred Scott? Lawrence, what did the Supreme Court determined in, in Dred Scott in 1857. He shouldn't, he wasn't free, he shouldn't have been free in the first place and that he shouldn't be in court in the first place because he wasn't considered a whole person. He wasn't considered not a whole person, but what were black people a not considered? Citizen. Right, no black person in the United States was considered a citizen. So if you're not considered a citizen of the United States, do you have rights and protections under the Constitution? No, you do not. So this is the loophole. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery, but it did nothing in terms of overturning the Dred Scott decision. So you have four million free people who are not enslaved, but are still not considered citizens of the United States of America. And many observers pointed out you know, the issues at hand here. What we have, uh, this, this image here from Harper's Weekly, which was one of the popular weekly magazines during the 19th century. Uh, this illustration was made by Thomas Nast. He was probably one of the most prolific political cartoonists of the 19th century. And he did you know, searing critiques of of white Southerners during Reconstruction. So here we have an illustration, and actually I'll turn the lights off so we can see a little bit better. At the top, the question marks, slavery is dead? And then he has below that civil rights bill. So this was made in 1866 where Congress is debating a new civil rights bill to protect rights of people. You have the Emancipation Proclamation, slavery is abolished in the United States Congress, um, but through these illustrations on either side, it's talking, it, it's essentially alluding to the fact that conditions have not fundamentally changed for African Americans. Just because we have emancipation, just because we have the 13th Amendment, it doesn't actually mean that the lives of African Americans 
have significantly improved because they still do not have constitutional rights. And therefore, things like the black codes don't infringe on their rights because they don't have any rights to begin with. Now, despite the ongoing conflicts between Congress and President Johnson and the effectiveness with which black codes prevented free people from truly being free, Congress nevertheless moves quickly to, to start improving the situation. So the month after um, the war comes to an end, Congress approves the creation of the Freedmen's Bureau. So this was a federally funded relief organization that was largely staffed by black and white union veterans. And their job, with bureau locations scattered all across the South, was to help in the transition to a new post-war South. And specifically to help with the transition from slavery to freedom for African Americans. So, the Freedmen's Bureau, it directed early efforts at education, opening Freedmen's schools. It oversaw the signing of labor contracts between freed people and employers. And you know, education and labor go hand in hand. If we recall, literacy had been outlawed across the South prior to the Civil War for, for enslaved people. It was against the law for them to learn how to read and write, which is not to say that no free people could read and write. There were plenty of people who you know, secretly sought education and literacy, but the vast majority of free people still were illiterate. And if you're gonna sign a labor contract, it's important that you know what is in that labor contract so you're not being taken advantage of. So one of the roles of the Freedmen's Bureau was to go through these new labor contracts to make sure that the freed person understood what they were getting into when they signed that, that agreement for employment. The Freedmen's Bureau also oversaw the distribution of food and clothing and other resources to both poor blacks and poor whites. Because remember, we still have a sizable, landless, poor white population in the South who are struggling to establish some sense of life after the war. Um, and you know, overall, the Freedmen's Bureau works to, to try and you know, resolve disputes between different parties uh, during the post-war period. It also entertains proposals regarding land redistribution. And this is one of the big questions that we're going to get into a little bit later on here with you know, the relationship between land and what it means to truly be free and whether or not free people are going to be granted land uh, in restitution for generations of slavery. And initially, it looks like, yes, there is going to be land redistribution, but then that goes sideways, and we'll get to that later. So in the fall of 1865, midterm elections are held, and the southern states, which is really kind of hilarious what happens here, they just go ahead and they have regular elections, and they elect you know, new congressmen to the House of Representatives and new senators, they send them all up to Washington, D.C., and all the, the Northern Republicans, they're like, you haven't even been restored to the Union yet. What are you doing here? Go home. You're not allowed here yet. And so what this means going into 1866, Congress, both houses of Congress remain entirely Northern and overwhelmingly Republican which is important moving forward because everything that we see here, the 14th Amendment, the Civil Rights Act, the Military Reconstruction Act, 
These are all passed over presidential veto. This is part of the reason why Johnson eventually faces impeachment trials, because he tries to stop every single Wait. piece of reconstruction legislation. It was passed over presidential veto? Passed over presidential veto. So Congress was able to override the presidential veto with a two-thirds majority vote. So what this means is that 1866 is a year where Congress is able to kind of hit the ground running. And, and try and move the reconstruction process forward in an important and meaningful way. So the first important piece of legislation is the 14th Amendment, which is passed in 1866 and fully ratified in 1868. And the purpose of the 14th Amendment is to plug in, to, 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 to fill the loopholes of the 13th Amendment. So it's the 14th Amendment that overturns the Supreme Court decision in Dred Scott. It declares that all persons born or naturalized in the United States are considered US citizens. And so in addition to overturning Dred Scott, it also makes the black codes illegal. So those black codes that were passed in the immediate aftermath of the war, they are now no longer legal with the passage of the 14th Amendment. The white Southerners, their efforts to recreate the conditions of slavery are severely hampered by the 14th Amendment. Now to kind of bolster the overall rights uh, outlined in the 14th Amendment, we also have the Civil Rights Act, which basically declares that you know, all, poor, all persons who are citizens of the United States, they have rights to buy and sell and lease lands. They have rights to sign, uh, to, to enter into contracts, to go to court, um, and so on and so forth. So, so it expands upon you know, what falls under the specific rights of citizens of the United States. Now the 14th Amendment, oh yeah, it also made void all claims to compensation for lost slave property made by slave owners. There were thousands of slave owners who appealed to the government saying, we want financial compensation for the loss of our slaves. Basically, pay us back for the value of these human beings. The 14th Amendment says, no, not going to do that. It also, all right, more 14th Amendment stuff keeps popping into my head. It makes it so that anyone who had initially pledged loyalty to the United States but had engaged now in a treasonous act against the United States, was no longer able to run for office. So what this means is that, technically speaking, all those ex-Confederates who, who had previously been elected officials going into secession, they are now no longer eligible to run again for public office. Finally, in the provisions of the 14th Amendment, Congress held out the proverbial carrot. Any state that immediately ratifies the 14th Amendment as is will no longer be subject to any further reconstruction efforts will be brought back into the Union and their rights of congressional representation will be fully restored. There is only one ex-Confederate state that does so. Anyone want to hazard a guess on that? Lexi, I think you got it. I don't think I have it. Um, Virginia? No. Tennessee. Tennessee. Oh, this is my first guess. <laughs> the Johnson's home state, Tennessee. Tennessee answers the call, so Tennessee is not put through military reconstruction. 
The stick. There's the carrot and the stick. The carrot is restoration if you ratify the 14th Amendment. And Congress basically says if you don't ratify the 14th Amendment, we're going to make it hard on you. And so in 1867, they create the Military Reconstruction Act. It's like, all right, you're not, you're not going to go along with the 14th Amendment. Now we're going to make it harder for you to be restored to the Union and have your rights given back to you. So the Military Reconstruction Act, which also passes over presidential veto, this establishes explicit requirements that a state must meet in order to be restored to the union and to congressional representation. So each state had to draft a new state constitution in conformity with the US Constitution, which meant that there had to be state level constitutional conventions with representatives elected from districts across each state to go and hammer out a new state constitution. What's important here is that we see hundreds of African-American men across the South who were elected to these state-level constitutional conventions. So black voices are critical to the drafting of new state constitutions towards readmission to the Union. And as part of those new state constitutions, they have to include provisions for voting rights for all men regardless of race. And they still have to ratify the 14th Amendment. Once all of these provisions had been fulfilled, then the state could be readmitted to the Union and granted congressional representation. Now, what the Military Reconstruction Act does, uh, I'll come back to that, those slides in a minute. In addition to laying out those requirements, it destroys the Confederate states and reorganizes them into five military districts that would be ruled under martial law. So in other words, federal troops were stationed across all of the South to maintain law and order and to protect the rights of freed people. And part of the reason why we see so much political participation and so much voting on the part of freedmen is because they are being physically protected by federal troops to go and vote in elections. So we see in 1867, upwards of 90% of eligible black male voters voted in 1867. So there is an enormous outpouring of black political participation with the coming of military reconstruction. So we have, in our five districts, we have Virginia is District 1, the Carolinas are District 2, Florida, Georgia, and Alabama are District 3, Mississippi and Arkansas are District 4, Louisiana and Texas are District 5. Tennessee gets to escape from military reconstruction. So each of these states have two dates, our black date and our pink date. Now the black date is the date of readmission to the Union. So that's the date at which each of those states had fulfilled the provisions of the Military Reconstruction Act and were brought back into the Union. But the more important date here is the pink date. The pink date is the date of the defeat of radical reconstruction government in those states. So basically what that means is that during military reconstruction, when we have so much black political participation in the South, we have black and white Republicans being elected to all sorts of public and political offices from governor, vice governor, all the way down to local mayors and school superintendents, okay? And so these states, which previously had been staunchly Democrat and white in terms of their political makeup, are controlled by elected Republicans, both white and black. 
I want to say it was actually, was it Georgia? That had a black Republican governor. And, and so that pink date, that represents the date where those Republican-led Reconstruction governor, governments are overturned by Southern white Democrats. Right? Was it Pinchback? What? Was it Pinchback? Might have been. I can't remember his name. Right. He had a really crazy name. It was like Thinking Benton Stewart Pinchback. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I, I that is a it, fabulous name, by the way. Yeah, I, I remembered it from the, the war class I took with uh, Professor Price. So okay. Like, yeah, I remember him. He was like the first black governor like, ever. Like, yeah, and then there wasn't another one until like, Recently, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, one of the things that we haven't mentioned yet, but is always in the background of Reconstruction, is the escalation in violence of white Southern violence against Reconstruction efforts, specifically violence directed towards freed people and their white Republican allies. So when we see these pink dates with the overthrow of Reconstruction governments, basically each of those states over time, they had federal troops taken out of their borders once they were restored to the Union. And through the actions of white domestic terrorists for the most part, in large part it's the Ku Klux Klan. But we also see other white supremacist groups like, um, like the White League. They coordinate efforts in order to terrorize black voters, to harass, beat up, and murder elected officials. Um, we see you know, governors that are murdered and, and thus replaced with white Democrats, and so on and so forth. So those pink dates, those show the return to rule by white Democrats in those in those southern states. Megan? Um, this might just be history stereotyping itself, but um, wasn't the KKK like kind of like a glorified frat group at first? <laughs> like they was just a bunch of white guys gathering around like I miss the old days and they would just talk about literature and stuff and then it just nope. Okay, great. <laughs> no. Their their number one job from the very beginning was to, to terrify black people and white Republicans. And the reason why they wore the sheets over their heads was to make sure that they could not be identified for this, uh, and be prosecuted for their actions. So yeah, the Klan is always gonna say, we're just another fraternal organization. But no, that's not true by any stretch of the imagination. Good to know. CMR? Who killed Lincoln? Who killed Lincoln? John Wilkes Booth. Who's that? John Wilkes Booth was the son of one of the most famous actors in the country. And he was also an actor, not as good as his father. And he, along with a group of friends, conspired to murder Lincoln and all the members of his cabinet when the war came to a close. They believed that they were doing the patriotic thing by killing all members of the administration. Um, and so the efforts to kill the other members of his cabinet failed. I think it might have been William Seward. He got hurt, but he didn't get killed. So Booth, he goes to Ford's theater on the night that Lincoln and, and Mary Todd, they go out to the theater to watch a play, and he gets into the presidential booth he shoots Lincoln in the back of the head and then jumps off the balcony and lands on the stage, breaking his leg in the process, screams out, Six Semper Tyrannus, meaning um, death to tyrants, or this is what happens to tyrants, basically. And then he takes off. And uh, it doesn't take too, too long for him to get caught. And then he and the other conspirators, they end up imprisoned on trial and then executed. He's buried in the family lot, presumably, at Greenmount Cemetery in Baltimore, but his grave is unmarked um, because basically the cemetery doesn't want people messing around with John Wilkes Booth's grave. So are they, were they like Southerners? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Other questions at this point? Lawrence? 
I'm backtracking a little bit. Do you have any specific dates for the black code? Basically, they go into effect from right after the end of the war uh, in 1865 until the 14th Amendment is passed in 1866. So they're only around for about a year. Okay. Yep. Now getting back to the uh, the Freedmen's Bureau and its role, we have two. We have very different perceptions of the, of, of how the Freedmen's Bureau functioned, and also what it means in terms of you know the status of freed people and the rights that they are trying to achieve in the aftermath of the war. So here we have um, you know, an illustration titled The Freedmen's Bureau, where we have a Union Army officer who is trying to hold back you know, angry groups of ex-Confederates on one side and freedmen on the other side. You know, trying to heal the breach. Here we have the, you know, the stars and stripes in the background here. Trying to, to manage the, the ongoing conflicts uh, and frustrations between these two groups. So it puts the, the role of the Freedmen's Bureau in a positive light that they are doing very important and necessary work in the South. Here, on the other hand, and this is made in, I believe, Pennsylvania. Yes, it is Pennsylvania. Ex-Confederate. Here we have a democratic view of the Freedmen's Bureau, and it speaks directly to that stereotype of black laziness. You know, remember what we've seen where you know, Southern whites argued that without slavery, African Americans will essentially just be idle, they won't work, and they'll devolve to a state of barbarism and savagery. We have a banner here that says, the Freedmen's Bureau, an agency to keep the Negro in idleness at the expense of the white man, twice vetoed by the president and made a law by Congress. Support Congress and you support the Negro. Sustain the president and you protect the white man. And then we have the, the images here of you know, an idle black man, while we have you know, diligent, hardworking white people in the South who are trying to rebuild their homes and farms and all this other stuff. So it plays on caricature and stereotypes. And we see running throughout the political arena during Reconstruction, this is a ploy used by the Democratic Party against pretty much all Republicans. For example, when Ulysses S. Grant runs for election in, the, in 1868, Democrats label him, and forgive me my use of this term, they label him the nigger candidate because of his public, open desire to protect the civil rights of free people. So the Democratic Party plays on these racial fears and racial, racial stereotypes and caricatures that Republicans, they're trying to elevate black people at the expense of white livelihoods. And that white lives and, and white rights are being stripped away because the Republican Party, they favor black people over white people. And so this is, this is where we kind of get at the heart of the political struggles during this period of time. Any questions or comments about these illustrations? Could you say that the same um, messages are still being sent today to you know, in, in, in parties to like make it so that like certain things can't get done. The language today, and I think really since 
the 80s, right. has become more nuanced. So, for example, we have the, the Reagan revolution of the early 1980s, Ronald Reagan. And he is you know, wildly popular. You know, he wins the 1980 election in a landslide. And, and since the 1960s, when he had been governor of California, so Schwarzenegger wasn't the first movie star to be governor of California. You know, he had come out against you know, so-called welfare queens and people who were gaming the social welfare system and stuff like that. He was using coded language implying that it was black women yeah. that were gaming the system, that, that were profiting from social, social welfare mechanisms. Now, he didn't come right out and say it's black women, but he used that phrase welfare queens, which was a totally made up thing. Nobody was profiting off the welfare system in the way that he was talking about. And when he became president, he talked about how you know, we need to cut away from social welfare um, programs that benefit the poor. And when you look at the, the socioeconomic demographics of the United States, the, the people in the communities that would be hardest hit from the welfare cuts that he proposed were primarily non-white. So, so we see a rephrasing in terms of you know coming down on the poor rather than saying oh we don't want to help black people we don't want to help brown people um, the language becomes much more nuanced and we see the racial undertones more hidden and you know if we look at if we look at the language that's used today it is layered with the influence of the internet and social media and conspiracy theories. So like, I can't tell you how many times I have run head to head with people online that think that the party switch never happened. Okay? Anybody know what the party switch is? So Megan knows, Lexi, anybody else? Okay. So notice how throughout this whole time period that we're looking at, the people who are anti-Reconstruction, anti-black rights, they're Democrats, right? Democrats led secession. Democrats led the Confederacy. Lincoln's party is the Republican party. That's the party of radical reconstruction, of emancipation, of black civil rights and freedom. What the hell happened? Well, the party switch happened. What people don't understand is that political parties can and do change over the course of time. The Republican Party of the 1860s is not the Republican Party of 2021. The Democratic Party of the 1860s is not the Democratic Party of 2021. And it hasn't been for a very long time. So as we progress through the course of time, we'll see where these switches are taking place. But basically, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, when he is elected in 1932, he becomes the model of the new Democrat and the change in the Democratic Party. So he is considered a class traitor. He was born into wealth. But instead, as a politician, he reached out to women and black people and immigrants and the poor. You know, we, we have his New Deal programs using the full force of the federal government to try and pull the United States out of the Great Depression, which was fundamentally opposite of what the Democratic Party traditionally wanted to do. They wanted less federal government intrusion. So FDR, he represents a turning point for the Democratic Party where it becomes more large government, more liberal, more multi-ethnic and multi-racial in nature, and so on and so forth. In terms of the Republican Party, we see the Republican Party becoming increasingly conservative, uh, beginning with Richard Nixon. Uh, so when he wins the 1968 presidential election, Republican strategists realize that disaffected white Southern Democratic voters who are still in favor of segregation, 
they essentially are a population that's ripe for the picking for the Republican Party. So with the Nixon administration, we start to see more and more ovations to racist white voters in the South. And, and so that kind of, that, that's a new trajectory for the Republican Party from the late 1960s on. And so we can, we can see from FDR and from Nixon how the Republican and Democratic parties have evolved, or in some respects devolved, to where they are today. So does that make sense to everybody? Does that make, because I've had many classes before where people are like, wait a minute, why are we talking about the Democrats who hate black freedom? <laughs> And that's because these political parties have changed dramatically over the last century and, and a half. Okay, are there any questions? So three concession areas, when minstrel C started? We start to see minstrel C becoming increasingly popular by the 1870s and 80s. So a little bit more post-war uh, is not really Big yet in the 1860s, but we're starting to see it, you know, emerging by the end of Reconstruction as as a, pop, a popular entertainment. Same thing with vaudeville. Any other questions? Okay, so we have the political activities that are going on. What does this mean in terms of the lived experiences on the ground for freed people in the South? Because here we have a population with some serious demographic significance. Four million freed people represent a one third of the overall Southern population. And as we've already seen, that's one third across the entire South, but in some states like South Carolina and Mississippi, those states have a black majority in their populations. And probably the most significant pieces of evidence that show us the changes and alterations that are being made is the appearance of new black institutions in the post-war South. And the most important of these are churches and schools. So the, for churches, historically in the slave South, there really were no black churches to speak of. In, in some of the urban areas, Charleston, Richmond, where there were sizable enough free black populations, we see black churches and congregations. But in the rural South, black churches really weren't allowed to exist. And so enslaved Christians, they were brought to white churches by their masters to stand in the back and be preached to by white ministers who would remind them of the importance of loyalty to your masters. A very um, you know, white-oriented interpretation of Christianity to try and convince black people to accept your subservient place. And so most of the black religious activity that, that took place in the plantation south was through underground churches led by enslaved ministers. With freedom and reconstruction, though, all across the South, we start to see the establishment of black Baptist and Methodist churches in particular. So, so these two evangelical faiths are the two most dominant Protestant faiths across the South. And we see these churches being established everywhere. And they become critically important social institutions, not just religious institutions. Because for most of these congregations from an early period, it was the ministers who tended more often than not to be literate. And so in addition to congregations coming together for the sake of listening to sermons and for prayer and for singing, there would also be time taken out for the ministers to read from the newspaper to the congregation. 
And this was a way for the entire community to be aware of what was going on, locally, statewide, and even nationally. Free people understood that to be free and to be a citizen, you needed to be well informed. You needed to know what's happening with Reconstruction. What's going on in terms of local laws and policies and things like that? So the church was a perfect environment where you have all the members of the community gathered at the same time so that everybody is on the same page. Everybody gets all the same information at the same time. So regardless of the literacy rates within the congregation, the minister would take that time to read the newspaper so that everybody could talk about what are the common issues that matter to us and how are we going to address them moving forward. In addition to the churches, we have the establishment of schools. And early on, the first black schools were the Freedmen's Schools. These were established by the Freedmen's Bureau, and they were primarily staffed by white women from the North you laughing I just, you know. <laughs> We've discussed the various motivations of these women and how they felt. So white northern women who felt called to the South to do the good work of teaching freed people. They come down as volunteers to work in these freedmen's schools. And the reason why Kelsey and Lexi are kind of laughing is because one of the books that we've discussed uh, for their independent study talks about how some of these women were deeply committed to the cause of black education. Many of them kind of perpetuate the racial hierarchical dynamics where they don't really genuinely see the potential for black education and uplift through their activities. They're there because they want to be, they want to have the experience of being the new mistress, where they would get put up in plantation houses, they would have money given to them, food, resources, and they relished the new power dynamics that they had. They got to live you know, the romanticized Southern life where they now wielded all of this control and power over the black men, women, and children in these freedmen schools. So the status of these female teachers is really complex because some of them are there and it, essentially they're perpetuating white supremacist attitudes. Others are there because they are committed to the idea of black uplift and yet others were free black women of the north who also went south to teach in these schools and found themselves in a strange situation where on the one hand, they, they were not entirely like the people they were teaching, but on the other hand, they're not treated as equals to the white teachers that were also there. So they're in this weird liminal zone, these, these, these northern black women. Um, and for their part, the students in these schools, because of the anti-literacy laws that had, had been passed under slavery, these were not schoolhouses in the traditional sense where it's all kids, but we have multi-generational students, parents, children, grandparents. Sometimes there were, there were accounts of, you know, the children would be picking up skills faster than the older people, and so then they would work to tutor their parents and grandparents. But in the activities of these schools, and in the outpouring of the number of people who went to the Freedmen schools, again, we can see how, for free people, they understood how critically important education and literacy were if they were going to move forward as free citizens of the United States. You need to be able to read and write. You need to be able to understand a labor contract. You need to be able to read in order to be informed about local and national politics, to be able to make good informed decisions when you go to vote. So these institutions to get, taken together are critically important to this transition from slavery to freedom. 
uh, help kind of visualize transformations on the landscape, here we have a map of the Barrow Plantation in Georgia as it looked in 1860. So we have a planter's house surrounded by the slaves' quarters, all very regimented. And here we have the gin house in the back where the cotton gin was located. And the dotted boundary line shows us that this was a pretty sizable plantation. Here we have that same plantation in 1881, so 21 years later. The planter's house is still there, now just labeled house. The gin house is still there. But now, instead of the you know, highly organized slave quarters, we now have the broadly distributed uh, houses of tenant farmers. And we're going to talk a bit about sharecropping later on. But then just outside the boundary of the plantation, here we have a black Baptist church and school. So this is what we see happening across the plantation south. We're just beyond plantation boundaries. You would have these institutions created at a relatively easy distance for all of the, the tenant farm families who lived and labored on those plantations. And what we see in the division between blue dwellings and red dwellings is that we have those who were formerly enslaved on the Barrow Plantation, who stayed on the Barrow Plantation now as tenant farmers. And then we have other black tenant farmers who moved to the Barrow Plantation to labor there. Are there any questions? Here we have Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper with an illustration of one of the freedmen's schools. And at the bottom it reads, Mrs. Cook's Schoolroom, Freedmen's Bureau, Richmond, Virginia. So we have these you know, well-meaning white ladies teaching reading and literacy uh, to, to the children in the school. Not notice how you know, it's, it looks like it's all children here. Here we have another freedmen's school, the teacher out front. We can get more of a sense of the, the multi-generational backgrounds. Here we have a couple of adult women in the back here and children of various ages. Now over the course of time, as more and more black students became educated and literate, progressively we see the replacement of these northern white volunteer teachers with local educated black teachers. So that eventually these freedmen schools would simply be known as the black schools uh, taught by black teachers uh, and run entirely by local African American communities. Okay, so another aspect of this question over, you know, what does it mean to actually be free? The ability to have institutions of your own that are meaningful to your community, that's an important aspect. But if we go back to the very earliest period of colonization and settlement in North America, land ownership is central to the American idea of freedom and independence. Because if you own your own land, and this applies to most of American history, if you, apply, if, you, if you own your own land, this means that you can be self-sustaining. You are not beholden to anybody else for your livelihood and well-being. You are in, completely in charge of your own life if you own your own land. And so even as the war was still going on, there was a question over land ownership for free people. And in 1865, as William T. Sherman was driving across the Lower South, leaving chaos in his wake, 
he issued field order number 15, which set aside about 15 million acres of confiscated ex-Confederate lands to be given to freed people. Now, he basically did this because he just didn't want to be bothered by freed people coming to his Union army. But from the position of African Americans, they saw this as this is land that is now ours. This is restitution for generations of slavery. And once the war was over, land redistribution efforts then became the job of Freedmen's Bureau. And the Freedmen's Bureau proposed the very modest idea of 40 acres and a mule. Have any of you heard that phrase before? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is the idea that if you have this, 40 acres and insert draft animal here, mule, cow, horse, that's what you need in order to be an independent yeoman farmer. And this is incredibly modest, especially compared to the Homestead Act, which was passed by the federal government during the war in 1862, which provided 160 acres of public lands for only a $10 registration fee. So 40 acres and a mule was a great and very modest idea. You know, give all free people this amount of land, and then they can establish themselves as free and independent yeoman farmers. Well, here's the problem. Through Andrew Johnson's amnesty plan, confiscated Confederate lands were given back to planters, many of whom proceeded to violently evict free people off of their lands. So then the big question remained, not only, you know, okay, now that we know what's happening with the land, but what are free people going to do? What is, the, what is labor going to look like? in the post-war South. So when we come back on Friday, we'll pick up with sharecropping. Sharecropping is the answer to the big question over how is labor going to be reorganized in the South now that slavery has been abolished.